It's my husband. He's gone missing. Missing? I'm terribly worried. It's just Fred's never been gone this long before. How long has he been missing? Since the funeral. Well, I can start right away. For me, it's, there's a sort of a, a bone-deep kind of DNA of this thing ever since I raided my father's bookshelf back when I was a kid, uh, this sort of tough guy material. And I had a friend, Anthony Begarosi, my writing partner. And together, the two of us just decided that there weren't enough private eye movies, not enough old-school tough guy sorts. This, you know, um, Back in the day, you'd see Lee Marvin and John Cassavetes in this sort of thing. and. Uh, so we, we set out to write this, uh, one, sharing character. I would do one character, he'd do the other. Well, that doesn't work. You can't write a movie that way. But we did come up with something that over the years, in various iterations, managed to fail upward until we got the right actors. And the, 13 years later, it sort of just magically came together. Um, and we're actually quite pleased with the result. We're, we're happy, as, happy as could be. There's no such thing as an easy anything. <laughs> Um, you know, Shane and I go back a long time, 30 years, and we did, uh, he, he's a 21-year-old uh, uh, college graduate from UCLA when he wrote eight, Lethal Weapon, and that was 86, and uh, we made that in 87, and then, of course, we went on to do Lethal Weapon 2. He was actually in Predator, a movie that we made in 87, and then Last Boy Scout, and uh, he took a kind of a period of introspection, which I wasn't part of, and then he, uh, we did uh, Kiss Kiss in 2005, but he had written... Uh, nice Guys before that, like 2001, and uh, we had tried a few ways to do it. He had decided to direct Kiss Kiss, we made that one first. We tried to do it as a television series, we tried to do it as a, uh, you know, a mini-series, but finally after he made Iron Man 3, which was um, essentially uh, one of those, uh, you know, get, get out of jail free cars, whatever he wants he can do, and uh, he didn't go to jail. And, uh, and he said, I want to make uh, Nice Guys. And we started talking about it, and within, you know, literally, I mean, in the magic of some of the process working, uh, Russell said, you know, I, I like it. I, I think it would work. And at the same time, Ryan said, well, I want to work with Russell, so I like it. And then we had a movie. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, not, that you can't manufacture that. You either have it or, or, or you don't, you know, but the key to it it's, it's not really that complex, you know, it's just about listening. If you're listening to each other, you're tuned into each other, it doesn't matter what left step he takes or what improv he decides to do, I can go with him because I'm actually listening to him. You know, I don't anticipate what he's going to do um, or, you know, make any assumptions. So, and, you know, it goes both ways. So that's really all, you, all you're seeing is a couple of guys who are very aware the other guy could do anything at any given moment, so you'd best tune in, you know. That freaks me out. I mean, it's the best scream in feature films since Gene Wilder. And that's saying something. That's a hell of a scream. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's always fun to get to paint with different colors and to get to uh, play these kind of roles you're not typically thin-sliced as and to get to do it with these people. I mean, I'm, a, I'm essentially a fanboy who's lucky enough to be along for the ride. I mean... Uh, Shane and Joel are a huge part of my cinematic upbringing from my childhood and to watch two of my favorite actors create this incredible symbiotic comedic performance that where one doesn't work without the other and it's just so present and every take was different was uh, really just an incredible education for me. Oh, I could have made it work with that Ryan, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the cool thing about working with Shane at this period of his life, when he's had you know the ups and downs and the slings and arrows and all that sort of stuff, he's at a point where he really does understand that you got to trust who you hire. You know, now we're both very respectful of the script and we'll do it the way it reads, but then we also bring ideas every day and say, well, what about if we move it like this and move it like that? And Shane just trusted that, you know we would work within the spirit of what he intended. You know, they wouldn't suddenly just be doing some other movie, you know. <clears throat> so there's a lot of stuff, and it's on a daily basis. And, and like I said, it's actually, some of it's not discussed, some of it's just in the moment, something's apparent, and you go for it, you know, so. It was great seeing Kim again, you know. Uh, we actually we were talking, and we realised we hadn't been in the same room together for over a decade wow. when we were shooting, you know. I mean, it's very different 
cinematic relationship, this one, you know, compared to what we did before. And, you know, because we had so many hours together when we worked on LA Confidential and we had a real intimate friendship. It was great, you know. So, um, and that still remains, you know, it's a funny thing about this business. You can go through a cycle and not see each other for years and years and years, but if you've connected, you still connect the next time you, you, you see each other. So, yeah, it was fun to see her and all that, but uh, a very different work experience this time. See, it's great. I'm in a country yes. that knows what corpsing means. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing the press in America, and you know, you talk about it, people go, I, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> um, if you take the 26 years of making lead roles in feature films prior to The Nice Guys, the amount of times that I would have corpsed on camera in that whole time, 49 feature films or whatever, would be less than any given week of shooting nice guys. <laughs> this little bastard makes me laugh. <laughs> and he's just, I, sometimes I would suspect, like he was up all night trying to think of a way to make me laugh in a sick, you know, because he just, he has this sort of natural comedic gift, you know, and uh, he's a funny bastard, man. So yeah, I laugh my head off all the time. <clears throat> we had a funny story, we blocked off a section of sunset, you know, and it's a very simple shot. You know, we just gotta pull in, we gotta look at a billboard, a couple of lines of dialogue, Drive off, done, scene's over, you know? And we pull in and <laughs> Ryan's just not on the script. He's just, he's jamming on some idea that's in his head about German spank films. <laughs> and, and I'm just falling apart in the car. Like, I can't get my dialogue out because he's like, because then he goes into that pseudo German that he does in the movie, you know? <laughs> Such conviction, you know? And he's got like about 25 words that sound like he means shit or asshole, but like, none of them are actually real, you know? So he's doing all that. And you've got Joel Silver standing in the middle of sunset, you know, going, I got the whole goddamn street blocked off to shoot my movie. Not tonight, guys! Not tonight! <laughs> and he goes back behind the monitors, and me and Ryan are sitting in the car, and I said, so are we going to do it with the script? And Ryan goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> The idea is that I had various reasons for setting things at Christmas, but the, the one thing that I didn't want to do was keep doing it once people noticed. <laughs> because it was supposed to be something that flew under the radar, it was my little delicious secret, and I thought, oh, this is kind of fun, it has a meeting for me. But then questions like this one... Sorry. No, no. <laughs> Ruin it for everybody. And, and suddenly I realized, oh, so now if I do it, it's going to be a question. You know, so I just said, you know, it doesn't really matter. Um, in fact, I've written scripts that didn't get made, that weren't set at Christmas. Mm. And if they'd been made, I would have... Uh, I, I don't know. It's just a fabulous time. The first thing I ever saw that was set at Christmas that affected me that way was called Three Days of the Condor, and it was a Sidney mm. Pollack film. And it just had a wonderful sort of hushed background effect against which the other stuff, the real deadly, chased by assassins stuff, seemed to play. And I've, I've basically been doing that sort of thing ever since. Look, I mean, the, 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 we're blessed with an incredibly uh, uh, talented, goes without saying, I mean, just brilliant, you know, uh, uh, performances from everybody. I mean, I mean, the young, uh, my young friend here, Russell, he's, he was great. And, but the little girl, Angari, I mean, she's 15 years old now, she was 13, made the movie. I mean, she, you know, is incredible. And all the little girls around her, all the friends, the, 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 the guy, the character Chet, fucking Chet, as we refer to him, that's, he's Jack, uh, Jack Kilmer, he's Val Kilmer's son. Um, I mean, we, we really were able to, to, to fill the, uh, the, uh, the, this, the stage with just very talented people. And they were all great, pros, fantastic. I mean, it, it, it didn't hurt that we had Russell and Ryan who've done this a few times. So uh, there was always this a tremendous uh, ability to everybody get the job done and do a great job. There's this sort of joke that we've been making about Angari being the most mature person on set. <laughs> and it's kind of a joke, but it's kind of real too, you know? Um, she always was prepared. She came ready to, you know, give everything she had. She's, you know, very limited experience, but uh, a, a fine intellect and, and a real enthusiasm for the, the, the craft. So it, it was great. The thing is, to get her to that place of, of comfort, you know, apart from the work that, that Shane did with her, you know, Ryan put a lot of effort into that, you know, and uh, just a few days ago we were just having a chat and I, I said to him, I, I just knew you were going to be a great dad when I saw you do that because he took yeah. time and he was gentle with her and he was like, you know, and open and then she just started to, to flower because she felt comfortable and, and, and she could own the space, you know, so it was, it was really cool. 
Yeah, before we move, I, I, we can't say enough about this little girl. I just yeah. want to stress that. I mean, and she is so guileless and so open and so un. I mean, the, I've read, I, I confess, I've read a few reviews, and uh, they, they, they mention her, and they go on, and I went to her and said, are you aware of the press you're getting? Are you aware that this thing steals the movie or only thing, you know, that is without question, you know? And she goes, oh, I haven't really read, really? I mean, she just doesn't even know that she's good. She's just this wonderful, innocent, guileless little girl. And you can't, I mean, God bless us for having found her at the time when we did. Ryan has a history with, uh, well, the, with the Mickey Mouse Club. He was uh, a, a child uh, performer himself. And he took the time to, you know, we, we had these people coming in and, and he took time to get to know who they were and what they were. And he worked with them all with us. And you know, we thought we were, we thought, I mean, we had a few girls that were coming from the States and we thought we were going to be fine with that. And, and then this, you know, tape came in from Melbourne, this, you know, little Australian actress that nobody really knew. And we thought that she could be magical. And let's bring her in and see her. I mean, we didn't know that it would go where it was. And, and we, you know, we had a whole day of, of auditions and she was the last one in and it just uh, was done. That's an example that Joel touched on then of, of Ryan's work ethic. In the audition process, he researched each of the little girls who were coming in. So he had a question he could ask them relating to previous jobs they've done or where they came from or whatever he could sort of uncover them. That's just sort of, you know, a, a, again, another indicator of what he did in order to make people comfortable in the situations. Well, here's, here's the good news where that's concerned, is that, I, you know, the pitch consists of a man, Joel Silver. And if I can convince him, <laughs> then, you know, and, and he'd, he'd look at me sometimes and say, what? And I said, no, no, Joel. But he, he gets on board. He gets it. We have a similar sensibility that goes back 30 years. So even after I'd done what was a very successful film, Iron Man 3 at that time, afforded an opportunity to do something. I just went back to Joel. I went back to the well of not just private detective films, but Joel, with whom I've enjoyed both my best financial, no, that's not true, and my best creative <laughs> success. <laughs> All I can say, um, because I've got a bit of canoodling to do on that issue, um, is I love this idea of a sort of a landlocked, or in this case, a, a time-locked franchise which means it'll never catch up to us. So the sequel would be something in the 80s that was reflective of a, an issue or something in that era that we could throw these guys against, you know, up against that wall and see what sticks. Um, I just think that's a fun idea to do a sort of timeless privatizer that proceeds through a series of historical uh, incidents. But no matter how many you make, you'll never quite get up to the present day. A strange thing with the idea of sequels, you know? Seems like every movie that I ever do, people start in press conferences and like that, bring up the idea, oh, you're going to make a <coughs> sequel. And it seems to me that every time somebody brings it up, it just doesn't happen. I'm so sorry. So thanks for fucking I'm it up so for everybody, sorry. man. <laughs> Gee whiz. Nice guy. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. You know, it, it's certainly, we didn't throw everything against the wall with these characters. There's a lot to, yet to mine, so it, it could be fun. You know, for some reason, Ryan and I think the title, The Nice Guys, Mexican Detectives, is hilarious. <laughs> I can't even say it without laughing. <laughs> and I don't know why. I don't know why, but there's, there's something about it. <laughs> there was a series of books, uh, the MASH series, which was the Richard Hooker, what was the name of the author? Anybody know, remember? But they did the movie MASH, but he also did MASH Goes to Hawaii. It was the same lettering with the little asterisks in between. MASH does this, MASH does that. And it, was, it had that sort of flavor to it I loved. Which, uh, and uh, they made like seven, no, they actually only made three Shaft movies, but they're like four Shaft books. You know, this is, mm. There's a lot in the 70s, a tradition of, of sequels in this genre. Because uh, I'm not a big sequel fan normally, but there's always another case for guy, these guys to solve. <laughs> well, I, I was going to comment on that when you asked about Anne Gowrie because she is such a consummate professional that, you know, it was the first thing I filmed and I had to, like you said, throw a young girl through a playcast glass window. 
and I immediately felt the need to ingratiate myself to these two young girls and let them know I was a parent and that I was on the level and that we were just playing pretend. And they just both stared at me very blankly like, yeah, so? Like, so well, that's like, right like we don't know window. this. Throw me through the window. What you got? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it? I want another take. I know you got more than that. So they, they, they took me to school. Oh, I mean, you do kind of a cold, a dry run you know, with the stunt department. I mean, it was all very professionally handled and prepared. Well, let's be fair, the, the one through the window was actually a very small stunt person. I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything. We I talked have, about it for yeah. a while. It's just, I just thought it was such a brilliant idea. Ray. We actually shot a little piece, it's not in the movie, of him just sitting by himself in his apartment, right? Just deep in thought, and you can hear the laughter from the live show that's going on downstairs. And then just over time, you see the laughter seep into him and he actually then smiles. I don't know what it meant, yeah. but it, it was really cool to Can shoot. Can we put that back? <laughs> okay, I'll get it back. I'll put it back. Okay, okay. Back tonight. Yeah, I, I, there's something really sort of beautiful in that. You know, he doesn't really have much of a life. He's got no friends. He's got no relationship. He lives this very Spartan sort of lifestyle. You can actually read some of his history in the way that apartment looks. You know, people might have ten of something. He's only got one. You know? <laughs> yeah. And he can walk from his bed to the front door in a straight line and grab everything he needs for the day and out the door, you know? But there's just something quite sad and beautiful yeah. about the, the fact that he's, he, he lives yeah. above the laughter or something. He has a laugh track. His life has a laugh track. Yeah, yeah. it's wonderful. And Tim Allen's doing a lot of shows at the comedy store at that time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Look, I think it's very clear that he's dislocated. He's an East Coast guy and he's living on the West Coast, right? If you really look at his costume, there's a uniform aspect to it, and you can probably sift through and say that he spent some time in the Navy, which has got a lot to do with the sparseness and his efficiency and all that, you know? But the detail of his life, it's just not really required in this mood, you know? It's all just it's sort of sitting there behind his eyes, you know? It's all it's about, you know. You, you stand there for three months, something happens, and people like the result, or they don't. And if, you know, if you stood there and the result, they say, would you like to stand here during another one? And so I just try to preside over what I perceive to be the best environment for these guys to do what they do better than anyone else in the world. And uh, I'd be a fool. <laughs> not, I mean, my biggest problem was trying not to crack up and ruin a take, you know. <laughs> Ryan has a... Has a uh way of putting it he said I thought my character was called schmuck because that's what I heard most on the set because <laughs> every time we'd finish a take I'd look over to the monitors and Joel would be watching and going what a schmuck I, not that I can uh, it I mean we, I can sift through there's going to be a gag reel I imagine at some point we'll find a I, I, I mean the reality of this movie is it does have a beginning and a middle and an end which is kind of rare to the, in these days. I mean, you hear about movies, we're reaching the ending, we're shooting a new ending. I mean, you know, the movie, Shane sets things up and he pays them off. I mean, he, he, he starts things and he finishes them. And, and the script really is pretty much what you see. I mean, there were things along the way that we had to try to make shorter, but this is, this is the in, intention of the movie and we're very happy the way Unless it is. Unless you think that I just sort of opened a cage and then went and smoked a cigarette and came uh, back and said, oh, you got some film here for me. <laughs> you know, there, yeah, there was a script to this thing. Yeah, yeah. And when I'm talking in terms of improv, man, we're not just manufacturing stuff out of thin air. You know, the structure is there. You know, we know what the spirit of any given moment is, you know, but the, how you get to that point emotionally or how you get to how you deliver that uh, information expositionally, you know, Shane has, you know, was very trusting with us. And, you know, if, if either of us came with an idea, the discussion was always open. So it was, you know, it was a very cool environment to work in.